<laughs> All right, we got Charles on it tonight. All right, homeboy. So uh, you're on that? All right. Okay, so last week we were, uh, we were covering some terms, okay? We, today, this week, we're going to cover the personal uh, attributes of God. Um, last, last week, uh, we're going to go through a few of the terms, and we'll jump back and understand. Um, but you all know the terms. All right, so you guys remember what theology was? We all remember what theology is. All right, well, let's cover this first. Every attribute, and we're going to get into this next week, what, and he's going to, Dr. Schneider is going to explain this better. Uh, God is not indivis- indivisible, okay? He's not made up of parts, okay? So we understand by that that all of, God, all of God's attributes describe all of God, that there's not a segmented God. You can't have, can't have glory or you can't have a, um, grace without having free will from us. You can't have a loving God without knowing that uh, wrath is there. You can't, have, you can't have righteousness without understanding that there must be justice. Okay, all these things walk hand in hand, all of these. So to understand all of God is this steadfastness. All of God, all his attributes explain all of God. And there's, he, he'll explain it a little bit better, but in, in our perspective that we get a thousand pieces of God, knowing we know that there's 90,000 pieces, but he gives us only a thousand to understand who he is. So these, this in, interconnecting, every time we understand a little bit more, we get a bigger picture of the puzzle of God and who he is. So systematic theology, according to Grudem's definition, is any study that answers the question, what does the Bible teach us about any given topic? This definition indicates that systematic theology involves collecting and understanding all relevant passages in the Bible on various topics and then summarizing their teachings clearly so that we know what to believe about each topic. We, we gather topics about the angels and understand that there's uh, angelology and uh, uh, demonology, that we understand the totality of the big picture, the bigger picture, that we under, understand the salvation of God and throughout the whole the whole Bible, the, the Old Testament is Christ uh, concealed, the Old Testament is Christ revealed, that we understand the Christophany through the whole Bible, we get a better picture of each doctrine that comes through. And that's what uh, inevitably is, occurs through theology, is doctrine. A doctrine is what the whole Bible teaches us about a particular topic. Is it a formalized expression of a foundational belief? And this is what we understand the doctrine of man to be, the, under, the doctrine of angels, the doctrine of Christ, that these are uh, a gathering of, um, uh, uh, of different studies of God coming together. Okay, go. Oh, he does it on? Okay. A formalized expression of a foundational. A formalized expression of a foundational belief or fact. A belief. It, is, it it's walks hand in hand in the, in the Bible. Okay, it walks hand in hand. It, it, we, we see the Bible as, as fact. Blessed are the ones that uh, believe and do not see. Okay, so we, we believe it is as fact. But it's a belief that we, until we are glorified, oh, I won't say it like that. <laughs> I was about to say it. We, we see it as fact, but it's, a, it's formalized. You know, you're going to get me always. If I, you're going to get me. Well, I'm just no. No, no, that's about good. the stuff of God, and then you go to tell them, well, they say, where do you get the information? How is it that you believe this? If it's not factual, so I got to that. Yeah, no, it's, that's good, sis. That's good. It, we, we, we. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I'm going to get you both lapels. All right. So s- theology is, a defini- is defined as the study of God. The doctrine is defined as the systems of teaching on a specific subject. And just to clarify what we're doing for the next 18 weeks is that we're going through um, systematic theology. They're seminary college courses. And, we're just, and if you make it through this, if you make it through this, if, if you come back every week, you will be transformed. This is what I did for the last almost four years. This is what, uh, this is what got me uh, ordained is the deeper things of God. This is what got me steward of a, my own church. 
you know, the whole thing. So what I'm saying is that the, for, the, the, the deeper that we dive in understanding who God is, the deeper and more blessings that we, we have that deeper relationship. You, you, you don't get intimacy until with, a, with your mate until you truly understand who they are. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's the same thing with God. It's the same thing with God. Until we truly understand who he is, we're not truly worshiping the God of the Bible. So we have to truly understand who he is. So with all that, today we're going to be doing a personal God. So let me go back here real quick. All right. 26 minutes, guys. Today we begin a discussion of the next major section, the divine nature. Um, uh, the, the strategy here is <clears throat> to discuss, and uh, there's really no good way of saying this, th to discuss what sort of thing God is. What sort of being is he? Okay, there's really just no comfortable, seemingly reverent way to say this. Um, we're talking about the, the essence of God. What is God? Now we're going to, after we have this discussion, we're going to, more specifically answer the question, what is God like? We'll talk about the attributes of God. And of course, in, the, in this process here, we're also talking about what God is like, but um, uh, we're, we're making more fundamental, definitional uh, statements about God as we talk about <clears throat> the divine nature. So, um, as we begin a discussion of the divine nature, uh, the, the visual image there of the puzzle is, is intended to remind us of uh, D.A. Carson's analogy, if you remember his illustration, that uh, theology is not like a puzzle of a thousand piece, pieces where there's one missing and we can never complete the picture, but rather theology is more like uh, a puzzle where we have a thousand pieces but we happen to know that there are 90,000 pieces in the puzzle. And many of the pieces that we see, that we have, fit together, and we can see that they fit together, but it leaves a lot of gaps. There are things that we just can't understand because we don't have it all. It's not all revealed to us. We don't know all of the pieces, and so we have to be careful not to treat mysteries, theological, genuine theological mysteries, as problems to be solved. And we're going to be, starting now, we're going to be bumping into that problem, I think, on a fairly regular basis for a few class sessions. And when that happens, the, uh, I, I believe that it's our job, it's our duty to define the mystery, okay, to understand why it is a mystery, and to keep going. Um, as, as Augustine said, if I could fully explain him, then he would not be God. So, um, with that admonition uh, hanging over us, let's talk about the divine nature. Now, in this section, we're essentially going to make, uh, I think it's four um, assertions about God. God is personal. God is an infinite spirit. Uh, God is a trinity. And God is holy, okay? For what we might think of as fundamental uh, descriptive statements about God, and we're going to seek to establish them um, biblically, and this will set the stage for, the kind, for, for uh, a discussion of the divine attributes. Um, and, and for now, we're answering the question, what kind of God do we worship? Um, given world religions... Okay, we have all sorts of different ideas about what a God is or can be. Some religions picture God as an impersonal force. Some picture him as the life spirit. Um, some picture him as um, a personal God who, is, who has certain uh, characteristics, the absolutely sovereign and capricious God of Islam, um, multiple personal gods as with various pagan religions and so forth. So, we're going to make these fundamental definitional uh, assertions about God and seek to understand them uh, biblically. In some cases, I'm going to make the statement, but then I'm going to, I'm going to sort of push pause on that discussion uh, and refer us to another part of the syllabus later on where we're going to talk in more detail about uh, that or related concepts. So, first of all, God is personal. 
God knows and understands himself and his creation. God knows and understands himself and his creation. So God is personal, and by personal, I'm contrasting that with impersonal. Okay, God is, is a personal God, a personal being, as opposed to an impersonal force. Okay, like the Zen Buddhism of Star Wars. Right, the force, may the force be with you. It's this impersonal life energy that just permeates all living things and you can draw upon it. That's, that's, that's Zen Buddhism. Okay? Uh, in contrast to that, God is personal. And by that I mean God is a person. Okay? In uh, Romans 11, Paul mentions uh, the, the, um, uh, the unfathomable depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. He talks about his judgments, which, uh, which speak to his, uh, to, to his wisdom. Okay, so God has knowledge. God knows things. Impersonal forces cannot know things. They cannot understand. Psalm 104 talks about God's wisdom in creation. And, and I think this does relate to, um, to uh, general revelation as we talked about it before. Uh, the psalmist says, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. In wisdom you have made them all. That means God thought about it. He knew what he was doing. Uh, Paul speaks of God's, uh, uh, God's wisdom in salvation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, he says, to those who are, who are called, both Jews and Greeks... Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, as opposed to the foolishness. Okay, to to uh, Gentiles, the gospel is foolishness. But as far as Paul was concerned, the gospel was the embodiment of divine wisdom. It was the embodiment of divine wisdom. It was the 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 pinnacle of divine wisdom. Okay? Again, an impersonal force cannot act wisely. It's just there. And you can draw on it. And it's got a light side and a dark side. But not God. So God is personal because he has the power of intellect. Okay? That's, and, you know, honestly, guys, one of the more difficult philosophical problems, and we're not going to get into it because it is a philosophical problem, is defining what a person is. Okay, that's a good conversation for you to have over lunch sometime. What defines personhood? Um, and so the, the goal here in this section is to keep it very um, obvious as to, uh, by identifying characteristics of God that are personal as opposed to impersonal. You can get into all sorts of sophisticated debates about what the definition of personhood is. Anyway. So, God has the power of intellect. Secondly, he has will. He has a will. In other words, God acts with a sense of plan and purpose. God acts with a sense of plan and purpose. God does what he does for a reason. Now, one of the most important theological truths about understanding divine sovereignty is that God never does anything for only one reason. God never does anything for only one reason, as far as we can tell. God's sovereignty is uh, rich and complex. But when he acts, he does act with a sense of plan and purpose. He, uh, we're going to talk later on about, when we get to God's relationship to the universe, we're going to talk about um, his, uh, his plan, his eternal plan for the universe. That before the foundation of the world, he had ordained the unfolding, uh, the events of the universe that were to unfold after creation. So God acts according to that plan. So he acts according to plan, a sense of plan and purpose. For instance, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, although we could read um, Ephesians 1 pretty much the whole chapter, uh, but Paul says, in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ 
according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved one. Okay, so God's, um, in, in this particular context, he's talking about redemption and more specifically predestination. But the purpose of all that is the praise of his glorious grace. There's a purpose to the actions that God takes, okay? We also see in Isaiah 43, uh, another example, we, won't, we don't have to look at every single one, but uh, in this case, the, 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 uh, uh, the author here, Isaiah is looking, is uh, delivering an oracle. He's, uh, it's a poetic passage. And God is speaking to Israel as the ones whom I have made for my own glory. We saw the creation psalm, Psalm 104, earlier on, uh, where God delights in his creation and his creation gives glory to him. We saw it under, again, under uh, general revelation. When God uh, decided to create or purposed to create, he did so for his glory. He had a purpose in mind. It wasn't just a random decision. He wasn't bored or lonely. There wasn't anything acting upon him to force him to necessitate the activity of creation. He decided to do it for his own glory. And that's, that's what scripture is about. Redemption in Christ for the glory of God. Okay? So God is personal in that he acts according to a sense of plan and purpose. So he has a will. We'll, talk, we'll also talk more about the will of God later on uh, under, under the sovereignty of God. We'll talk about <clears throat> the different, or I guess the problem of evil. We'll talk about the different senses in which God wills something. Which I think is clear in Scripture. Thirdly, God is, God is personal in that he displays dispositions and emotions appropriate to interpersonal relationships. He displays dispositions and emotions appropriate to interpersonal relationships. In Scripture, when God's people are obedient, he is delighted in them. God delights in righteousness and justice. We saw that in Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, at the very beginning of our uh, discussion of theology proper. God delights in them. That means it makes him happy. Um, when God's people, God's creatures, are rebellious against him, it grieves him. Genesis 6. Ephesians 4, verse 30. Okay? Sorrow is attributed to God. Um, associated with that is the anger of God. God is angry when his covenant people rebel against him. When his moral creatures uh, are settled in their rejection of him. Okay? So we see uh, there, there are emotions associated with God's love as well in Scripture. We're going to see all of that under a discussion of divine impassibility. Okay? That's a, a discussion we'll have later on. The history of Reformed theology, well, at Reformed theology as it passed a certain tradition down to us, um, contains uh, some, some significant debates about whether God has emotions, and if so, what the character of those emotions are. How many of you, I'm curious, how many of you would be surprised to hear that theologians you respect asserted that God does not have emotions? How many of you would be surprised to hear that? Okay. <clears throat> we'll have some good discussion around that. Uh, fourthly then, God is personal in that he is self-conscious. He is self-conscious. <laughs> not in the sense that we use the term. Like you're worried what everybody thinks about you. Not self-conscious in that way. <laughs> he is conscious of himself. Okay? He is self-conscious as a human being is as opposed to self-conscious in the way that my lazy dog is. Sometimes I wonder about the consciousness 
of my dog. She is conscious of really only one or two things, you know, food, the thing she's most conscious of, and whether there's somebody around that can scratch her in just the right spot. It's pretty much all she cares about. She's got the family routine down pretty well. You know, Sunday morning, she gets fed and she just goes straight into her cage because she knows that's where she's going to spend half the day. But she's not conscious of that, you know. When we had two dogs not too long ago, I used to, okay, I used to enjoy teasing my kids um, <laughs> by giving one of them a treat but not the other one, you know, just to hear my girls squ uh, squeal about that. Dad, she wants one too. And I would say, oh, do you think she's feeling left out? <laughs> because as far as, you know, as far as my kids, I mean, my, you know, 12, 16, 18, 19 year old kids, you know, these are not little. As far as they're concerned, you know, my dog is sitting there going, why won't he give me one? Was it something I did? You know, I really, really hope he'll give me one. The animals are not self-conscious in that way. They're not sitting there thinking about anything. Okay? If any, if any of you remember um, the Far Side cartoons, I know that they're still out there sort of in, in, in a certain kind of publishing immortality. Uh, but I remember when Gary Larson was still making the Far Side. And he would play with that notion, the idea that we think that dogs are self-conscious and are thinking about what's going on. And he would have fun with that notion. Um, but they're not. They're not self-conscious in the way that we are self-conscious. Um, there's, there's an attribute of personhood that we can think about ourselves and think about how we are relating to others. Okay? Person, uh, in my opinion, a lot of personhood is, is uh, defined by the ability and characteristic of having relationships with other people personal beings. Okay? Anyway, self-conscious. I, I didn't mean to wax eloquent about Nikki the dog there, but uh, under self-consciousness, we can say God reveals himself as a unique person and not an impersonal force. He, he, he reveals himself as a person who is distinguished from other persons. Okay? We'll get to relatedness in a little bit. He identifies himself by name. This is the, the idea of demonstrating, of revealing yourself as a unique person. He identifies himself by name. And uh, I'm going to quote the uh, Christian Standard, the Holman Christian Standard Bible here, because, and you'll see why. Uh, God replied to Moses, this is when Moses said, Who shall I say has sent me to the Israelites? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Then he goes on in verse 15. God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites. Yahweh, which is a derivation of the Aramaic I am. Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. God identifies himself by the name Yahweh. The reason I'm quoting the CSB here is because they uh, have, have appropriately transliterated the Tetragrammaton here because Yahweh is, is being used as a proper name. You'll notice that when I read the scripture in, in, a, in a seminary classroom, I will often take the capital L-O-R-D in, in English and simply use the personal name Yahweh. Uh, I, I prefer that. I don't do that when I'm preaching or when I'm in a lay setting uh, because you have to kind of explain what you're doing and, and it's just not necessary. Uh, but I want to be reminded, I want us to be reminded as we read the Old Testament that God spoke to his people in very intimate personal terms. He, he spoke to them using his name, the name that he chose to reveal himself by. It's not just a term of respect, the Lord, the Master, but rather a personal name that tradition has replaced with, you know, with the English word Lord.
Okay? So God identifies himself by a, uni by a name, identifying himself as a, uh, as a unique person. As a matter of fact, God's name is very important to him. He is jealous for his name. Again, in the HCSB, Isaiah 42.8, which is a pronouncement of judgment on the people of Israel. I am Yahweh. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Okay? It takes on, it takes on a more, I don't know, I guess a more personal tone when you put the name, the actual name, personal name of God in there. I am Yahweh. That is my name. You can't worship some other, uh, some other God as if that God had created the rain or created the mountains or was making your crops grow. I will not give my glory to another. Okay? So God is jealous for his name. Because it's his name and not someone else's. Okay? Questions? Nothing. Okay. I'm just surprised. It seems like, if I remember right, just a, a fun little play on words, that God says, my name is Jealous. So he almost, not only is he Yahweh, but I think it's El Kanat in the Hebrew, because that's, that's part of who he is. It's part of his name. Yeah, yeah. There are, there are a number of <clears throat> descriptive names of God uh, in the Old Testament, where God gives him, where uh, he is. He gives himself a name that describes the way he is acting in that context. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, how come the HCSB didn't um, translate Yahweh all over the place? That is a good question. Would you, would you prefer that to be consistent? If would I? Prefer, like if you were translating it, because uh, I've thought about that too, because sometimes you can see they, they get into trouble a little bit with the Lord, because it'll say Adonai Yahweh in Hebrew, yeah. and they have to do it Lord God with capital G-O-D, and I think at that point it starts to break down a little bit, because people are like, what is going on here? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really the guy to talk to about translation, translations, but um, in general, I prefer that we translate it, that we transliterate the Tetragrammaton, that it be, that it be translated as Yahweh. That just makes sense to me. Um, because God reveals it as a name. And, and we've seen a couple of cases, and that's the reason that the CSB did this. Uh, because there are certain cases where uh, the context demands that it be read as a personal name. You know, like when God says, okay, this is my name. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't make sense to translate that as L-O-R-D. The Lord, Adonai, or one of the other words for master, is not his name. Yahweh is. And that, as derived from the verb to be, you know, which seems to be an assertion, although this is open to debate, but it seems to be an affirmation that God is um, the, the self-existent one, and more specifically, the one who is always there, the God who is faithful, I am who I am, I will be who I will be. You know, there's more than one way to translate it. Um, you know, so then Yahweh would be the, the third person form of that. He is. So, you can also get carried away, taking too much, you know, drawing too many implications from, from the, you know, the etymology of Yahweh. There, there's a significant amount of mystery to why God called himself that. So, anyway. The point here, for our purpose at this point in the class, is that God identifies himself by name, which means he has, a, he has revealed himself in highly personal terms. Okay? Other questions? Self-consciousness. Finally, relatedness. God is personal in that he enters into relationships with other persons. And we've got many different examples in the scriptures. God makes covenants with people. He enters into covenants where he makes promises to them and they make promises to him. 
There are reciprocal agreements. Sometimes it's unilateral where God makes a promise to David, for instance. Or God makes a promise to Abraham that, that he would make a great nation out of him and that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him and so forth. That's a, a unilateral promise. But it's a personal promise from God to Abraham. Under the attributes of God, we're going to talk about how much of God's self-revelation in Scripture is intended, I believe, to, um, to witness to his faithfulness, his faithfulness to his promises. God makes a promise with a person, and he keeps that promise. So he makes covenants. Um, so he enters into agreements with people. He hears prayers. He listens. He invites people to pray. He hears their prayers. He answers their prayers. That's a kind of interaction that God has. It's a, um, it's a relationship that God has. He blesses the obedient, and he judges the rebellious. I'm not giving you specific examples because these are thematic examples here. He blesses the obedient. As I said before, God has a particular kind of personal reaction to obedience. He's pleased with it. He's happy about it. And he blesses that person. He is warmly disposed toward the obedient. And he judges the rebellious, the opposite um, disposition God has toward the disobedient, toward the rebellious. These are all attributes of personhood. So one of the first things that you have to establish in the study of the doctrine of God is what kind of God are we talking about? And clearly, to separate the true God from many false concepts of deity, we say that God is a person. God is a person. Secondly, God is an in Next, next week. So how'd you guys do? How'd you do? Uh-huh. I see smiles. And I'm telling you, when I first watched this, I'll show you the notebook someday, that everything... Hold on. Turn down the uh, computer. The COM. Got her. Thank you, big man. As we get into this and understand who he is, when I first got into this and I understood that you, you start feeling the change, the more you understand who he is, okay? We, he, let's try to bring some life to what he said tonight, okay? So he's talking about an intellectual God, a God that knows and understands himself and his creation, you, okay, that he's inner, he's interpersonal in everything he's done, so he understands what you're going through, what you're going to go through, and what you've been through. This is a this is the this is a beautiful blessing to understand that we can't hide anything from him, that he already knows what's going on, and all he wishes to do, and all we wish to do, God, all we wish to do, is shut off the 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 pain that we have. To focus in on him. And that's where, our, that's where our joy comes in. Is focusing in on him. And then that's where the transformation, sustainable transformation comes from. So he, his knowledge, understanding of who we are. So I, I should have put down, at the bottom I put down from creation to salvation. I should have put down into his sanctification and into glorification. He's bringing us into full understanding of who he is. And the, this is a, the chief end of man is to understand God and enjoy him forever. Okay, that is the chief end. That is our goal as, as Christ followers, is to understand who he is so we can enjoy him forever. And like I said, a thousand pieces that we're allotted to know, and I, I love that imagery because there's 80,000 pieces out there of an infinite God that our finite minds can't understand. And that's, the, that's just the immensity that he is. So we understand these little pieces of puzzle that he knows what we're going through. The, um, Psalms 130, uh, 139, that he knows who we are, that he's knitted us together in our mother's womb, that he understands everything that we've gone through, and that he will bring us into an understanding of what peace is. His will for us, that acts into a scene of 
plan and purpose. Why is that important for us? Why is that important to understand that it, not only has he built us, there is, or he's created us, and he understands what our frame is and what we can go through and how far we can go. Not only that, but everything that we've gone through. I have 40 years, 44 years, where I don't just, I used to think, man, it was just all worth nothing. It was worth nothing. All right, 40 years of being broken, 35 years of drug addiction, to understand now that there was a plan and purpose. Though it's, it, this is a hard swill to, or a pill to swallow, to understand beyond everything I had to endure. In three years of understanding fully who he is, it's, it's not just delivered, it is a change of the heart. But beyond that now, there's a plan and purpose that I can reach out to other people and I can help other people now. There is a plan and purpose behind everything he does. So what is, what is uh, I worded that wrong. What does it mean when scripture talks about his glory? And if you're going to speak, what does it mean when he talks about his glory? Now, I'll give you my definition. And everything I'm doing today, let me just say, guys, three and a half years old in the faith, Okay almost four years old. So what I, what I believe now, it's, gonna, it's core, but that's not going to change. But I, uh, the outer things, what I see, it's the unfading, vibrant beauty of God. That is his glory. The intricacy, intricacy of his, his creation, of interactions, of relationships, his beauty of uh, just songs and music, what he's given us to understand about life itself, that's his glory. This un but his glory is this unfading, vibrant beauty. And I, every time it speaks of God's glory, it speaks of this magnificence. So we understand it's just this, this beauty of him. So he's bringing his creature back into a genu genuine, loving relationship to him with the proper praise and worship, which is significant. And we understand that in the garden we were pulled apart with communion with him and the Tower of Babel with each other. That was when we were pulled into our own ethnicities and our own back. I mean, that's, that's when we were separated from each other. That's when he confused our language. So not only has now he pulled it all around for redemption of his glory, so we all speak the same language once we come to Christ in the name and his glory. His emotions uh, God displays dis dispositions and emotions appropriate to interpersonal relationships. And th at the bottom, I want you to think about this. I want you to understand this, okay? He sorrow, rejoices, having compassion, grief, anger, wrath. Does God have good days or bad days? Okay? Does, does he grieve or remorse? Script? Okay. Does he relent? Relent. Does he change his mind? Okay, well, he did he? he? Hold on. According to scripture, he says he does. Now, I want you to think about if he's, uh, if he's, if he's immutable, ever ch he's never changing. Okay? How can scripture say that as, at the same time that he's steadfast and never changes? I want you to think about this. Okay? Anthropomorphism. Yeah. It, it is a, it's, a, it's an act, a reaction from us. It's like I said, it's to enact a reaction from us. If he's steadfast, never changing, every time he says we relent, he relents or he grieves and remorses, we got to understand that if he's steadfast, of course he's going to punish the rebellion. We'll cover that in a second. But does he hold grudges or have anxiety? That's the only time. See, that's the only time he ever talks about rebellion or wrath or anger or uh, punishing is when we get out of hand. Okay, if you could look at the book, book of Job as the exception to the rule, but I see Job as a beautiful story of, 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 um, of God trying to bring him into a better understanding of who he is. So you're not going to... He wasn't really, no. Yep, and it's everybody... It ripples to the, where we're sitting right now because we're still talking about the lesson of Job. 
And see, it's, it's just a bigger picture of it all. It's, it's just it's to understand that he, he doesn't hold grudges because his son. He doesn't hold grudges. His son. His son is just the prime example of forgiveness. Foundational belief. Yeah. Yeah, that's the Old Testament. That's why we, we want to make sure to understand the Old Testament. Yeah. So self-conscious, self-aware. I'm sorry to put that word hasidity in. It means self-existent. It's not the same thing as this. As self, he, he, he doesn't need, like we need life or air and food. He doesn't need anything. It's not the same thing as self-conscious, self-aware. So forgive me for that one. I just want to say he reveals himself as a unique person, not an impersonal force. I, I love that. That it's, it's just everything we're going through today shows a relationship, a God that wishes to bring us in. He's already done it. What we need to do is understand that he has done everything that needs to be done for us to come into a relationship with him. Just have to extend our hands. Amen, sis. Yep. And that's the very thing. You want me, if I, you want me to slow down there, Sorrel? Okay. All right. And uh, the names, I was going to get all fancy, and uh, I, I can't do the third one. The, man, I, I even, before this, I, but the Elohim, uh, uh, when he's, you remember what he was saying, I, and I'm, I'm going to butcher this, uh, Trekgramacon or whatever, he was talking about uh, four letters. Well, it's just H or Y-H-W-H. That's the, that's the original Yahweh. Yahweh. That's the original. So Ra- Yahweh, Rafa, uh, Shaddai, uh, Uriah, but I can't say that third one. It's, it's I am who I am. That's what he said in Exodus. So he's jealous by his own name because, and this is what, I love, I love Verlene. She got me so good last week. I love it. Anyways, but it, it, it's the idea that we don't place anything before God, okay? And when we, when we start doing other, other idols, and your, your, your mate isn't jealous until you make them jealous, but they're not jealous until you're made to be jealous. He's, do you see my point? Is that he's not, he's not jealous all the time. It's not, it's something that happens because of our reaction. It's a reaction to what we do. So we got to understand it's just, he's steadfast in everything he does. He's jealous of his name because he's enacting a reaction from us. We got, can't put nothing in front of him and us. It's him first and all else, all other relationships stem from that. Relationals. So he, he said it's them, thematic. So I, I actually put some. Um, uh, examples, scripture, exam, scriptural examples. And so God enters a relationship with other persons, with us. He swears by himself. He, and there's no other higher promise than that. He swears by himself. His covenants are real. He, they will not change. The only one that will change is us. The only one will move away is us. His address is always the same. So we understand that when he makes a covenant, and he, he promises to do the things he does. Man, I, I'm, I'm walking. And I will use me as an example to the day I die. That in, in four years, he will change everything. Everything. And nothing will be the same if you truly understand who he is. If you truly understand who he is. I the I don't know. I'm going from the heart to the head right now. <laughs> I so desperately wanted it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, mine was. Well, I was I was so desperate for that. I was so desperate for something. I mean, forty years of just being broken, thirty-five years of drug addiction. You finally come to a point where you had enough, and then you just how do you get out of that cycle? But God, but God, God's got a way, and just learn who He is, and so He understands. He hears our prayers, even when you think. We, we see a temporal, we see at the moment in time, okay? But also he hears the prayers of the obedient, of the ones that are actually following what he says. Because if you're not following what he says, he, scripture even says, why you call me Lord and not do the things I say? All right, so we, we have to follow the things he says. And then he says, blesses the, the obedient. Gee. Hello, Redway Baptist. I'm telling you. He will, he will bless the ones that go after him. Man, I, 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 I had this, in, I, I know, my son said it, it sounded like fear. But I have this where I was getting into this, uh, and I started feeling the heart change. And so 
He says, I do. Okay, he says, I'm going to just do. Okay, scripture says, okay, just do this. Okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try to just, yeah, and so I'm going to obey what he says and see what happens. I, I told you that about the homeless guy and me in the shower, dude. I finally realized to the point where, okay, he's trying to tell me something. So, okay, I'll just, I'll, okay, he says, pray, humble myself before the Lord, and he will exalt, exalt me in due time. Humble myself. Okay, Lord, I don't know what you want me to learn from washing this homeless dude. Okay, so help me out. And then to find the joy of the Lord in, the, in it all. And then you f- see the transformation happen. And he says do these certain things, and you find it's just absurd in our perspective. And remember this. It's everything that we think is always contrary to what God, God has laid out. It's always contrary. His whole, his whole Sermon on the Mount, read the Sermon on the Mount. It's contrary to everything you, th- you, you, you walk and talk in this world. Judges the rebellious. He punishes us, man. He corrects the ones that he loves. Okay? And he punishes the ones that... We've been judged, brothers and sisters. You see a nation of just going haywire right now. Okay, so, and we don't get a breath right now, so he's helping us saints these days. So remember to follow, follow, follow the word. It changes, it changes, it does, little sisters, I'm telling you. So this is, this is today's, man. This is what we're going to do today. Next week, we're going to talk about the infinite spirit of God. And it's, it's, uh, it's not what you think, but I'm telling you guys, Keep coming back. Keep coming back. All right? Keep coming back. He may be humdrum. I'll try to bring some life at the end. But keep coming back. And I, I, I can't promise much, but he says, if you seek me diligently, you will find me. That, that wisdom of God. Okay? You continue to seek him. Any questions? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Before you go on, grab that thing. It's, it's called a mic because that's just dead air. It's just dead air. All right. Go. Um, just looking at the relatedness on, you were talking about the blessing, how he blesses us. And I think looking back then too, is he always has that plan and the purpose he was talking about at the beginning because his blessings are in his time and not ours. Amen. And I think that's when we look at this as a whole is, you know, we have our own timeline, but God sees everything and everybody. Amen, sis. He puts those puzzle pieces in, and we don't even know them. So I think that's, you know, just looking at that, like tying all these, um, you know, all of his attributes together is just amazing. The plan and purpose of it all. If we focus on just one, we might be like, oh, he's not, he's not here, he's not listening, he's not, you know. But he's got such a bigger plan, and it's so much more amazing than we can even fathom. (laughs) If we can get over the fact that man's inhumanity Man in humanity is going to always, we're going to be inhumane towards each other. If we can get, under, get over the fact that we treat each other as fallen children or fallen people treat fallen people. Okay, so there's always going to be strife. There's always going to be hate. Okay, when we don't have an objective standard by which we all stand by, there's always going to be that, that, uh, uh, that core um, um, problem in the way we react to each other or relate to each other. Go ahead. I love just to um, think about for myself and others is how does Jesus see us? Yeah. So because He sees us all, we're all in His image and or God's image. So if we see ourselves as that perfect child, yeah, it really changes and other people too. It doesn't matter what their exterior attitude, whatever it is, Jesus still loves them and sees them for who they are and who you know He intended them to be. That helps me a lot, just to, instead of seeing the exterior, it's like, you know. Yeah, yeah meekness. I swear I'm getting it. No, I'm going to get her a lapel. I am going to get her a lapel. Nope, too late now, huh? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's all, yeah. Okay. No, no, sis, but yeah. I mean, Scripture even tells us, blessed be the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We, we've got to understand that there's, there's a reason why 
who was I talking with? I was talking with Crystal today, and um, we got to understand the, the Book of Jonah. I, I love the I love the last of, uh, scripture or last verse now, um, where God is is uh, rebuking um, Jonah, and he's he's telling him that you know you're mad over this plant that you didn't create. How about the two thousand people that you didn't want to go help that can't that can't discern from the left hand from the right? Is that we got to understand that in this in this fallen world, when the objective standards or objective truth, the actual standard of truth, is not in people's hearts anymore, we've got to have that compassion on, and we got to understand. And it's it's a hard one because you want to hear justice being spoken, and right talking come out of people's mouth, and it's hard sometimes. I mean, I, I butted head with Cindy. I mean, her and I butted heads, man. I mean. But no, but it, it's good. With every, every with every struggle comes an opportunity to, of growth. With every struggle, go. And that's putting that definition first. And that's why I like when he said, you know, and I love this. I wrote down, you know, is to have that conversation on what is a pers- what is personhood, or yeah. whatever it was, you know, because before huh. we can even have a debate, we have to define what we're debating about. Yeah. So if yeah. we don't define what we're debating about, then we're just subjectively talking. Yep. So, but if we can define and of agreement on something, then we can um. see, and that, that blows me away these days. We have this, okay, and I, I, I mentioned this before, so sit, sitting up here, you guys sitting with a young pastor, I get to grow with you guys. So to have this reality where I find my eyes are so wide open to God's truth, and, and then I get to step back and look at this world from a different focal point, where for 40 years, 44 years, I've looked at that from the worldly point of view. Now I step back and I look at that the way it way God sees it, the way the Bible perceives it, and I, I start seeing that, man, there is, and what I did for so many decades, four decades, man, is whatever relative truth or subjective truth got me through the day, that's the lie I clung to. That's the lie I clung to. Huh? Amen. Forty years, yeah, in the desert, yeah, yeah, I walked it. <laughs> Praise God. All right, brothers and sisters, um, go ahead, Charles. You can go ahead and hit that red button. 